So yes, this is our first session uh, of the day, advertising environmental claims. Uh, you know, every single one of us working in advertising has the responsibility to ensure that the work that we make um, is trusted by the public. Um, this is going to be even more critical uh, when we consider the role of advertising in supporting positive behavior change um, and supporting a more sustainable living. We really have to get our facts right. Fortunately, there are clear rules around how to promote uh, environmental claims correctly and, and do this uh, with, um, without greenwashing, uh, that uh, wonderful uh, word. Um, and I think my soundings say that there is a certain nervousness around, you know, kind of saying the wrong thing. And of course, actually what we really want is people who have got a story to tell to be confident to tell their story and people who are worried about their story uh, to think twice about what they're doing. So that's the intent. Um, we've got some great speakers coming up to really kind of unpack the subject for us. Um, and the team at the Advertising Association, um, who, if you like, are the mums and dads of AdNet Zero um, and the Advertising Standards Authority, have agreed that actually we need to cover this topic pretty much every year to share the state of the art, how the science is driving um, our understanding of um, the claims territories forward and how the rules are um, adapting to that. Um, so we're fortunate today to have experts from the CMA, the ASA, and uh, Conscious Advertising Network to um, unpack and explain and discuss the very latest guidance on how to communicate environmental claims, avoid greenwashing, and discuss climate accurately. So we're going to hear a little bit from each of them, and after that we're going to have a, a Q&A. So, um, I'd like, uh, first of all, to, uh, hand, uh, to welcome Cecilia to the stage. So Cecilia Parker Arana is Director of Consumer Protection at the CMA. Cecilia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'll just wait for my slides to come up. Um, morning, everybody. Um, uh, as Seb said, I'm Cecilia Parker Arana. I'm a Director of Consumer Protection at the CMA. Um, I have had oversight of the um, development of the Green Claims Code, uh, and I'm currently running our investigations um, in the fashion um, sector. Um, I'm not going to spend um, too long today talking to you, because I, I think we're keen to get on to the Q&A and, and have some really interesting discussion um, about the, these topics, but um, I'll just run through a little bit about what we've been doing about the Green Claims Code um, and, and some of the other work that is going on um, at the moment um, in, the, in the CMA. Um, so I hope everybody in the room knows who the Competition and Markets Authority is. I am well aware that um, as a, an organization, we have pretty poor brand recognition. It's something that we are working on. Um, but we are the leading competition and consumer protection authority um, in the UK. Um, our job is to take action against businesses who are misleading consumers, uh, who are um, uh, not competing fairly with other, with other businesses. Um, and particularly for our consumer protection powers, the way we do that is to look at market-wide issues. So we're really trying to create a level playing field and drive positive competition between businesses. Um, you don't necessarily think of the CMA when you think about climate change issues or environment issues. But um, for, for us, um, transition to low carbon economy is now one of our uh, annual plan goals. Um, and it's something that I envisage will, will remain a top priority for us in the coming years. Um, and that's not just in the consumer protection space, but we're also looking at it from a competition perspective as well. Um, I decided I would put up a slide on what is greenwashing, but I'm guessing again, since you all work in the advertising industry, you will know what is greenwashing. Really, um, the, the reason I wanted to put up a definition is because I think there's a, there's a very broad definition of, of greenwashing where businesses are, are doing more to, to tell you about all the great things they're doing than they're actually investing in doing anything um, genuine. But from a, a consumer protection perspective, um, it, it's a slightly more um, uh, nuanced um, definition where, where businesses are making claims that make their products or their services or indeed their business as a whole look more environmentally friendly than it actually is, and that you are misleading consumers when you're, when you're making those claims. And so that's really what we, we are focusing on um, with the work that we are doing. Um, when we started out this work, so we, the thinking for this project started back in 2019. Um, we were uh, starting to gear up to launch a project at the beginning of 2020. Um, inevitably, that got delayed because of the, the pandemic. 
Um, but towards the end of 2020, once we got things up and running, we worked with an organization called the International Consumer Protection Enforcement Network, ICEPEN. Um, ICEPEN is a, a, a voluntary network of competition authorities, around, oh, sorry, consumer authorities around the world. I think we're nearly 70 members now, and that includes, um, as well as uh, national authorities, includes um, a number of international observers, um, the UN Conference on Trade and Development, the OECD, the European Commission, for example. And we carried out a sweep which is when our members get together and they sit down over the space of a day or a week or a couple of weeks um, with, a, with a kit and they look through websites effectively. And so our members um, in the end looked at a thousand websites um, that were advertising products, that were, were, that were marketing to consumers. Um, and in those websites, they found that 40% of the environmental claims looked suspicious. Now, that is not to say that 40% of the environmental claims were false or misleading, um, but we were looking at things like claims, claims using very vague terminology. So um, I, I both love and hate the word sustainable because it can, it can mean everything and it can mean nothing. Um, so we, we, we flagged um, sites that were using words like sustainable or eco-friendly without giving any explanation of what they actually meant. Um, we also flagged sites where they were making claims, but where there was no way for the consumer to figure out what evidence lay beneath them, which is another um, big area of concern. And so this figure of 40% you know, of sites looking suspicious, that tells us we need to take, we need to take action. Um, and so we started, sorry, I'll just skip back, I'm going, going too fast. Um, we um, started to talk to people and we ran a, a call for evidence and we spoke to businesses, um, we spoke to trade associations, we spoke to consumer organizations, international bodies. And one of the things that emerged was, as Seb alluded to, this uncertainty. Um, we want to tell people the good that we're doing, but we're unsure of how to, to comply. Um, now, I think inevitably the businesses that didn't care and were happy to just stick any old green logo on things or green label on things um, probably didn't uh, engage, engage with us. But the businesses that did engage were saying, look, we're trying our best, we want to get this right, um, and, uh, and we need more help to do it. And so that was when we decided to develop um, what became known as the Green Claims Code. Um, we have six principles in the code. I'm, I'm going to take you through each one. I'm not going to talk about each of them in detail because um, uh, we don't have time. Um, claims need to be truthful and accurate. I mean, I think that's a, that's a no-brainer. They have to be clear and unambiguous. So one of the things that we know is that consumers struggle with language sometimes. They don't necessarily know what you mean when you're uh, advertising to them. Um, and so we're really encouraging people to, to put things in plain language and to explain the language that is being, is being used so that there's no scope for confusion. If I take something, and, and we were talking about this in the green room, the phrase carbon neutral, um, there is no uh, global standardized degree definition of that. Consumers will take different things away from that. Um, and the likelihood is that they will shortcut the processes. Uh, so we, we, um, we all use um, intellectual shortcuts to, to make decisions. And one of them is, okay, it says carbon neutral. That must be the better option than this one over here that doesn't say anything, um, whether or not actually it's a genuine, properly um, uh, endorsed claim or not. Um, not hiding or omitting information. Um, now, this is, this is really about thinking about which facts your consumers need to have in order to make a decision. Um, and uh, this, is a, this is a principle which, you know, at the moment um, uh, you, might be, um, you might be making an advertising claim about a particular part of your product or a particular part of your supply chain, um, which doesn't um, uh, account for the, the majority of the, uh, of the impact that you're having on the environment. Um, and, and so by, um, by focusing on that part of the supply chain, and this also relates to one of the, the later principles, you, you could mislead consumers by not telling them that, that information. Um, another good example might be talking about reduction of plastics, for example, in your product, um, but the, the, the um, way in which you've gone about reducing the plastics has actually caused greater problems elsewhere. Um, so so that's, a, that's a key one. It's also one that I think will develop because 
the information that becomes important to consumers is going to change over the coming years. Consumers are becoming more discerning about what they buy, and it may be that a few years down the line, what affects a consumer's decision in terms of choosing the products has moved on. So that's, that's one that um, you really need to keep an eye on. Um, fair and meaningful comparisons. Um, this is not just about comparing your products to other, other, um, consu or other brands, but actually comparing what you're doing now to what you were doing previously. Um, and so we ask that, that you are um, using best evidence to, to support that comparison, that you're comparing like with like, and that you're not sort of using the, the com um, comparison in a vague way. Um, we see a lot of claims that relate to things being better for the environment, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't really explain better than what or, or, or how the improvements um, impact or, or how the improvements have been made. Um, this is probably the most important principle there is. Um, you need evidence to back up the claims that you make. Um, and it's not good enough to um, think about what you want to say and then scrabble around looking for the evidence to support it. It's not good enough to cherry pick, you know, find the expert that backs up your view and use that to support, uh, to support the claim that you're making. You need to have robust evidence um, with, uh, based on a sort of a general scientific consensus. Um, oops, sorry, I'm just, my, my timing clock is obviously prompting me to do something. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, th so that's, that's the, you know, the key thing here is to have the evidence to back up the claims that you're making. Um, the last um, principle, and this is one that has probably caused quite a lot of consternation, although we didn't intend it to, is about the full life cycle of the product. Now, at the moment, you don't have to do a full life cycle assessment for the products and, um, and businesses that, that, um, that you're advertising, um, and, uh, and, and we don't expect you to do that, with, with one exception. Um, but what we want you to do is to think about the context in which you are, are making particular claims because it's possible that you make a claim about, um, as I mentioned earlier, one part of your supply chain or one aspect of your product that leads consumers to think this is a good choice, but that actually is ignoring everything that's going on around it. And um, Justin's going to talk about the HSBC case that I'm sure many of you have, have seen, but that's a good example where um, you had a corporation making a claim about very specific actions it was taking um, in the context of um, a far less positive uh, global picture. Um, so think about whether or not consumers are going to be misled um, by uh, the claims you're making in the context of the supply chain. And um, we'll just finish up quickly on some other things that the CMA is doing now that we're, um, we've published the code. Um, first of all, we're telling everybody about the code, so um, uh, that's part of the reason I'm here today. Um, we have also launched enforcement action in the fashion sector. Now, we started with the fashion sector because it was an area where people were complaining to us um, a lot, um, not necessarily individual consumers, but we were kind of the intelligence we were getting was that it was an area where people thought there was a lot of greenwashing going on. It's also a sector which has a massive global impact um, on the environment, and it's a sector where um, we spend a lot of money and we create a lot of waste. So we're doing the enforcement action. Um, we're working with others. One of the things I get asked all the time as well, you know, when is it for the CMA and when is it for the ASA? The reality is the CMA and the ASA are in lockstep on this. We meet um, very regularly to discuss these issues, to compare ideas, to um, uh, prioritize and make sure that, you know, that we're, um, we're not getting in each other's way in, in choosing the, the, the issues that we're looking at. Um, and, and our guidance, the, the guidance that we've produced and the guidance that the ASA has produced are designed to complement each other. Um, we are also working internationally still with the International Consumer Protection Enforcement Network. We have joined the One Planet Network Consumer Information Program, um, and we're working with the UN Environment Program as well on some of the pieces that they're doing on, um, on uh, guidance and fashion. Um, and we're advising government, um, and we can perhaps talk about this in the, the Q&A, but one of the things that we've done is given some advice to government um, to recommend some changes on consumer protection law, and a couple of the key things there are coming up with standard definitions and statutory definitions for things like carbon neutral net zero uh, and for um, terms that are misunderstood regularly and misused regularly, like compostable biodegradable. So we think there should be some standard definitions that businesses are required to apply, which we hope will make things simpler for consumers, make things simpler for businesses, and actually mean that businesses are competing on a level playing field. Um, so I will finish up there. Um, you can find the Green Claims Code um, on our uh, campaign site. 
Um, and uh, yeah, do please take a look at it if you haven't already. Brilliant. Thank you, Cecilia. Come and take a seat with me. So our next speaker is uh, Justin Davis, who's the Climate Change and Environment Project Manager at the ASA. Justin, you're very welcome. Thank you. Glad to be with you today. Um, so, on to my first slide. So I'm, I work on the copy advice team at the Committee of Advertising Practice, which is the industry-facing side of the ASA. <clears throat> but I'm also um, a project manager on the ASA's Climate Change and the Environment Project, which I'll talk you through today. So, so today I'll briefly introduce you to the advertising code rules that the ASA applies whenever it investigates an ad. Um, I'll give you an overview of the Climate Change and the Environment Project that I'm helping manage, um, clue you into some research findings. We did some consumer research um, in the last year. Um, and just briefly cover the issue of ASA rulings, and in particular, the HSBC ruling. <clears throat> so the, the main parts of the CAP code that advertisers need to be conscious of and that are particularly relevant to environmental claims are Section 3 and Section 11 of the non-broadcast code. So Section 3 contains rules uh, that apply no matter what type of claim you're making, whereas the ones in Section 11 are specifically about environmental, environmental claims. And those are kind of any claims about your environmental impact or even kind of implied claims from the graphics. So I'll just run through these very quickly. Um, first one, uh, top point is claims can materially mislead through ambiguity or omission. So what that means in practice is um, Code Rule 3.3 um, defines material information as information that consumers need in order to make an informed purchasing decision. So as Cecilia alluded to, increasingly um, the environmental credentials of a product, its climate impact, are likely to count as material information to consumers. People are more concerned about the environmental impact of the products that they buy. Uh, the next one, fundamental point, if you're making an objective claim in an ad, it already needs to be backed up by evidence. So my advice in practice would be start with the evidence you've got and then kind of build your claims from there rather than think, okay, we know we've planted a wildflower meadow somewhere. Um, we know people like to hear the word sustainable. How can we make it work? So I'd say start from the evidence and then just kind of build it out from there and make sure that you have that evidence in place by the time, God forbid, the ASA ever gets in touch. Um, next point is that qualifications can't contradict the claim that they qualify. So what that means in practice is qualification here means a disclaimer. So if you're making a big headline claim um, about your environmental credentials, it's not enough just to kind of make a contradictory clarification in the small print. So for example, there was a ruling about a product where I think it said um, it was a soft drink bottle. It was described as 100% recyclable asterisk. And then in the qualification, it clarified that certain parts of the bottle were not recyclable. So that was considered an example where they had included that qualification, but it contradicted the overall impression given by the headline. Um, these final two bullet points are from section 11 of the code. So these are the ones that specifically apply to advertising claims. Um, quite a fundamental one is if you're making an environmental claim, the basis of that claim needs to be clear in the ad itself. So that's not about the evidence that you hold, that's about the information that you're including in the ad. So if you make a kind of overarching claim like sustainable, environmentally friendly, green, that kind of thing, consumers will reasonably want to know what's that based on, what does it refer to, what kind of metrics are they talking about? Does it refer to CO2 emissions? Does it refer to you know, what the product's made of, how it's recycled, that kind of thing? So my advice would be, Whenever you make an environmental claim, you need to give people enough to know what type of claim you're making. Um, the other one is, is it's a related point, but subtly different, is that the meaning of terms that you use in the ad also needs to be clear. So consumer understanding of terminology is often not quite as good as, as people think it is. I'll get onto that in a moment when we talk about the research findings. Um, so basically, I, I would say don't assume if you're using terminology that consumers will know what it means. 
um, to reduce the risk of breaching that rule, often a good idea just to put a little explanation maybe in the qualifications. Uh, and finally, this again echoes a point that Cecilia has covered. Uh, if you're making an environmental claim, the default assumption is that that's based on full life cycle information evidence, unless the ad states otherwise. So if you're referring to a particular product and you say this is sustainable, the assumption will be that's based on a full life cycle assessment of that product. If you're making it about a component in the product, the assumption will be a full life cycle assessment of the component. If you're making the claim about the brand as a whole, that's going to be very hard to substantiate. But th the point is, it's not that in every case you need to have that full life cycle evidence, but it is if you're, if you're not specifying that your claim refers to something narrower. So, those are the rules. They've been in place for years, but what's relatively new, and that, you know, if there's any perception that the ASA is kind of getting stricter in its approach, it's not that there are any new rules, but it, it, there is a change in emphasis in our regulation. So the background is things that we're all fairly familiar with, hopefully, here. Um, we're in a climate crisis. There are new kind of binding targets that we're all committed to, and particularly the Climate Change Committee um, establish that if we're going to meet the targets that we've set, that needs to result in some kind of behavioral change at the consumer level. So we're all here because we all recognize, I think, that industry and advertising plays a big part in that. And our response was that advertising regulation plays a part in that too. Um, in addition to that background, it's just the case that over the course of several years, the volume of complaints that we receive from concerned members of the public uh, sometimes from competitors, from interest groups. The volume of complaints about environmental claims, greenwashing, etc., it's steadily increased. So in response to that, we launched a project on climate change in the environment. Uh, there are various aspects to that. A significant one is um, very regular contact and consultation with the CMA, with other governmental departments, to make sure that we're all on the same page about what we're doing. Uh, we adopted the Climate Change Committee's sort of priority areas of transport, energy, heating, waste, and food. And we're doing kind of detailed reviews of the types of claims that are out there, what our precedent is in, the term, in terms of ASA rulings and so on. Um, we commissioned some public research on consumer understanding of terms. So the first research that we've conducted was in um, understanding of uh, kind of the electric vehicle sector, terms like... Um, self-charging hybrids, uh, PHEV, that kind of thing. We also assessed consumer understanding of um, the claims net zero and carbon neutral. Um, we've updated some CAP guidance, which takes you through the rules that I've covered, explains how they apply in practice. So that was first published in June, uh, and we're due to publish an update in the next month or so. Um, we've produced some new training materials. We've just launched a new e-learning module. Uh, which I think, um, I don't want to be misleading, I think it costs about £60, but I'd encourage everyone to, to check that out. And we're also doing targeted ASA investigations. So similar to the legal system, you've got the rules, which is like the law, and then you've got the case law, which is the ASA rulings on specific issues. And I'll give you an example of that in a sec. So... The research findings, we, we commissioned um, some detailed qualitative research into understanding of, of various things. As I mentioned, the terms carbon neutral, net zero, various terms in the kind of e-vehicle sector. Basically, the, the, the broad conclusion I, we, we took from it was that con consumer understanding of these terms is very poor. People don't understand what they're based on. And what that means is that probably in practical terms, you're going to need to add some information. So to go back to the code rules of the requirement to state the basis of claims, if you're making a claim like carbon neutral or net zero or even plug-in hybrid, any, any of these terms, you, you can't take it for granted that consumers will understand what that means. <clears throat> um, we also found that there was very minimal understanding of the role of offsetting. Uh, in particular, consumers kind of expected and understood that a carbon neutral claim would be based largely on absolute reductions. And once we explained the, the potential role of offsetting, there was a fair amount of surprise, a little bit of consternation, 
And a lot of the consumers that we spoke to felt fairly misled uh, when they saw a carbon neutral claim and learned about the extent to which offsetting uh, kind of played in the evidence base for that. Um, another major point was the need for standardized definitions. So that applied both to claims like carbon neutral, net zero, and in the e-vehicle sector. Um, it's not the ASA's kind of, uh, we're not really qualified or able to sort of impose our own definitions on industry, but it's, uh, it was a kind of loud and clear message from the consumers um, who were assessed in the research. And so our kind of takeaway from that is we're gonna reach out to various government departments. Cecilia's also mentioned that this is something the CMA is pushing for. And I think it will be but to the benefit of consumers as well as advertisers if we're all on the same page about what terminology actually means. Okay, just to get on to the uh, HSBC ruling, uh, this was quite a big precedent setting one recently. Um, whenever there's an ASA ruling, every single ASA ruling will set a precedent that will apply to other advertisers, but this one was quite significant, um, particularly because this was an example of a brand that made an environmental claim. It referred to some fairly specific positive work that it was doing, but the ASA basically concluded that it gave a slightly misleading overall picture of AS, HSBC's environmental impact because by kind of focusing in on some specific positive things, it misleadingly omitted the fact that HSBC was and is continuing to invest heavily in high emitting sectors. So what exactly this will mean for other advertisers, we're gonna try and flesh out in some very useful practical guidance for people. So stay tuned for that. Okay, and in terms of our resources, just to kind of help advertisers in these sectors, the ASA is not interested just in kind of punishing or anything. A major part of my role in the copy advice department, all of the committee of advertising practices work, and a major part of the climate change and the environment project is to help industry make responsible claims. We're trying to incentivize good practice. It's, um, you know, if, if there's an advertiser that are going to all sorts of lengths to improve their practices, and you know, they can make a well-evidenced, responsible environmental claim, it's not really fair to them if anyone else can come along and make a completely unevidenced, identical claim. So we're just trying to keep everyone on the, on the same page make a level, level playing field for everyone. Okay, so just to um, point you to some useful resources, I'd recommend going to asa.org.uk slash environment, which compiles all of the resources below, basically, and lists some important ru rulings. Um, the new e-learning module is on the uh, advice and resources section of the website. I'd, I'd recommend everyone take a look at that. Uh, we've got the CAP guidance, which explains the rules and how they apply in practice. That will be updated soon. Um, big database of advice, and I'll stop speaking there and hand over. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Justin. Come and take a seat. Um, so I would say that we're using Slido. Those of you uh, who are watching online, do pop some questions in. We may have time for a couple of questions in this session, so put your questions in. Uh, and then I'd like to welcome uh, Jake Dubbins, the co-founder of the Conscious Advertising Network, to join us. Jake, hello. Hi. Uh, thanks very much for uh, inviting me to speak. Um, and I'll just await slides to go through. So, yes, so uh, I'm here on behalf of the Conscious Advertising Network, which is a coalition of 150 uh, um, advertisers, uh, agencies, and civil society groups. Uh, but also represent ACT Climate Labs, which is a project of Media Bounty, uh, uh, our agency, and also a director of the Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit. So I want to talk to you a bit about getting past the greenwash. Uh, a lot of the work uh, and the words that have been said so far on definitions are really important, and some of the work that we're doing um, sits very uh, um, well alongside that. So firstly, you know, we need to sort of have a leveller here in terms of the numbers that we're currently facing. Uh, the Paris Climate Agreement commits us to 1.5 to 2 degrees worth of heating above industrial levels. We're at 2.8 degrees currently with pledges, just pledges at the moment, that are, uh, so we're miles away. Um, Mia Motley, who spoke yesterday at COP27, uh, said last year at COP that 2 degrees, even 2 degrees, that higher level, is a death sentence for small island nations. And according to the IPCC report, there is a brief and rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. Livable future is quite a terrifying statement. 
So, you know, we need to make sure that we are um, acting according to the numbers. Uh, the key takeaway from the UN Environment Programme um, uh, recent uh, report said that only an urgent system-wide transformation can deliver these enormous cuts. This is what potentially a non-livable future looks like. This is Florida in the aftermath of Hurricane Ian. Uh, this is not far from here, East London, uh, Wennington, uh, where, the, where we had 40 degree heat uh, earlier on this year. These are real people's homes burning to the floor. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about action three um, in terms of curbing the emissions from media planning and buying, but going further than that and being actually cognizant of the sort of media that all of us as advertisers and brands invest in. Similarly to um, uh, Cecilia and Justin, we've been working hard on definitions and we've worked with 18 different climate and disinformation experts on crafting a definition of what constitutes climate misinformation. So those groups include uh, ISD, Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, DSmog. They're not crafted by advertisers, they're crafted by experts. You'd be surprised, but climate change is a hoax is yet again a growing phenomenon around the world. Um, we've uh, recently commissioned some polling. We're going to COP, well, some of the team are already in COP at the moment in Egypt. I'm going on Saturday uh, to present this polling alongside a group called the um, Climate Action Against Disinformation Coalition, um, which is 50, uh, more than 50 groups working on climate, climate misinformation and more. Uh, and some of our findings uh, include that 23% of Americans believe climate change is a hoax made up by elite organizations like the World Economic Forum. Uh, that's a pretty terrifying stat when we're talking about two degrees being a death sentence for small island nations agreed by IPC scientists at every single country in the world. And then this is where this can show up. Uh, so uh, advertising uh, does fund this sort of narrative online. So you've got articles saying that climate, uh, the climate crisis is a hoax uh, funded by advertising. Fortunately, we've got a partnership with Google, uh, where Google uh, has a global policy on climate misinformation, on things like climate change is a hoax, and that advertising uh, is now removed. But it is elsewhere as well. This is literally in the last couple of days. Climate is a hoax on Twitter, sponsored by Volvo, sponsored by Deloitte. Um, so, and this is happening literally in the last couple of days, on the eve and during COP27. Um, so it's not just what is in the advertising, it is also what advertising is funded. Uh, this is Talk TV, the great climate change hoax. So bearing in mind 99.9% .9 of scientists agree that it's definitely happening and that it's us, this phenomena of climate change as a hoax is uh, populating the media and convincing um, consumers. Um, the second clause, and I would like to uh, you know, call out again this uh, precedent-setting um, uh, decision by uh, the ASA or, or, the, or the upholding of, of, of that guidance. Uh, both Cecilia and Justin talked about omission and cherry-picking, which is so very important both in advertising, but also in, again, the content, the journalism that, that, that consumers rely upon. So this definition uh, misrepresents scientific data, but also looks at emission cherry picking, but also solutions as well. So we're here at Ad Net Zero. 25% um, of Brits think that Britain cannot afford to hit the net zero target of 2050. So if that's 25% of the audience, what are you all doing here? Uh, and 19% of Americans think that net zero is a globalist. Note to the word globalist conspiracy uh, as well. So these are massive numbers. These are like a fifth of populations, a quarter of populations. Um, Again, what this looks like, this is uh, a, uh, a, a statement saying that the Greenland ice sheet is, uh, is making a net gain this year, um, brought to you and sponsored by Hilton. But of course, if you look at the NASA numbers, uh, that is the overall trajectory. So you can see again that cherry picking, that emission of data, the emission of the big picture. And again, this stuff is funded by uh, all of us. There's another example here on YouTube, apparently carbon dioxide is making the world greener. Uh, in this video, uh, this man talks about uh, that forests are uh, growing because of carbon dioxide. And again, you can see that's brought to you by Visa. Um, the third uh, definition, uh, or the third clause, is to falsely publicize efforts of supportive of climate goals that contribute to climate warming or contravene the scientific consensus on mitigation or adaptation. 
Last year, the IEA, not climate groups, the International Energy <laughs> Agency, said that no new oil and gas projects uh, are, are needed um, for, uh, to reach net zero by 2050. Um, obviously, that is happening, but the key stats here is 18% of Brits, 32% of Americans, and 41% of Brazilians believe that we can produce fossil fuels in a safe way that doesn't damage the planet. Scary numbers. Um, if you search the uh, Facebook ad library uh, and type in natural gas, there are over 50,000 results. Uh, so you can see that uh, American gas and oil is at stake, and this, uh, if applied here in the UK, on the right-hand side would be a clear example of uh, the greenwashing uh, uh, um, uh, that, that obviously Justin and Cecilia went through, fueling a greener future with natural gas. Um, so, uh, action five, I just wanted to come very quickly cover action five as well, so um, just because this is obviously the most important thing. You know, what I've gone through is that the media environment does influence our behavior, and therefore advertising and media has a role to play in that. But also, as Seb said up front, it's the behavior change also that we need to see. Uh, earlier this week, the Purpose Disruptors and Magic Numbers uh, released their report where latest advertised emissions uh, are now up to 32% of the carbon footprint of every person in the UK. So the question for all of us is, you know, we're all on a journey, every single advertiser here, every single agency here, how are we all going to drive down those emissions of entire categories? You know, how are we, how are we going to do that? Should we set a deadline to work, only work on briefs that are aligned to the Paris Climate Agreement, for example. You know, are these things that we should do? Um, because without delivering this system-wide behavior change that we talked about earlier on Action 5, we could be at risk of greenwashing ourselves. And then finally, just a few actions. Um, you know, go all in on Action 3. Uh, those um, definitions are in the Can Man Climate Manifesto. We have an open letter launching next week in COP alongside the polling. Um, which uh, asks the COP presidency, UNFCCC, and uh, media owners to adopt that uh, definition and, uh, and uh, put policies in accordingly. Um, have a look at ACT Climate Labs. Um, we've got climate misinformation reports, webinars, critical guidance. Uh, there's a report coming later, qualitative research on um, uh, reaching beyond the climate bubble, so those persuadable audiences. Um, and then go all on in Action 5 and ask ourselves, and, and this is exactly what Action 5 does, how are we going to change behavior? How are we going to drive down advertised emissions? Thank you very much. Well, thank you all uh, for opening up the, the topic um, uh, in, in different ways. I, I suppose there are, there are two thoughts or two questions that I have which I'd like to explore, and then we'll take some uh, from Slido. There's clearly an issue here with around, you know, advertisers and agencies want to use everyday understandable language. And as the surveys that you, the work you've done at the ASA and, and I think also at the CMA shows, you know, there isn't a very deep definition around citizens of some of the more specialist language. So I think advertisers then are kind of in a bind, really, which is how do you use the words that people are going to understand, at least partially, um, and, 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 and versus the more precise language that I think you would prefer, but is not really in, in broad circulation and understanding. And I think that's really the dilemma a lot of people, uh, a lot of advertisers probably feel themselves in. I don't know if you, maybe starting with you, Cecilia, just... You know, what advice would you give to advertisers? Because obviously you're looking for levels of specificity and precision, but that's pushing us to language that isn't used in everyday parlance. So, I mean, I think we're not actually necessarily looking for specificity and precision. We're looking to match what advertisers are telling people, and, what, and, and it's not just advertising that, that our rules cover, but what, what businesses are telling people with what people take away from it. So one of the pieces of advice I always give to businesses, and I fully appreciate that you know, for small businesses that, that's not um, always going to be possible, but do the research, talk to, talk to your customers um, and, and figure out, you know, if I use this language, what, will, what assumptions will be made? And if, if there's a mismatch there, think again, think about how you communicate. Um, it's something that we have to do um, when we are investigating businesses. Um, one of the things that we, we have to do is to try and figure out 
what, what the average consumer will understand from what they're being told. Yeah. Um, and we have in the past um, done things like um, uh, quantitative surveys, we've done qualitative research and focus groups. Um, we're actually at the moment doing some, some behavioural experimentation, um, getting uh, customers to do or get, getting um, consumers to, to do sort of mock shopping experiences so that we can try and understand the impact of what they're being told versus what the reality is. Um, so to the extent that you can do any of that, I think, Great. go out and try and find that match. And I was, um, you know, in a way I was trying to figure out in my own mind, you know, sort of pushing for either statutory or at least, at least in practice definitions, you know, is that going to help or hinder? And I thought, well, actually, no, that probably will help advertisers. So just say a bit more, Justin, about this kind of trying to get some more precise words into common advertising parlance with sort of agreed definitions. So that was definitely an interesting finding from the re research that we did, you know, both in reference to net zero, carbon neutral and the e-vehicle thing. You know, people kept saying, well, it's just very hard to interpret advertising if there's no common shared set of definitions of the terminology. Um, I think that gets you some of the way. So if, for example, if industry, you know, if let's say the e-vehicle industry reach some shared definitions of things, but consumers aren't really clued up on that, then that doesn't really solve the issue entirely. Um, and it doesn't really address the point of, you know, one of the rules in the code is, is that the meaning of terms need to be clear to consumers. So I think, you know, standard definitions that everyone agrees on is very, very important. But I think in terms of just practically speaking, it might also be necessary while we're waiting for consumer understanding to catch up just to kind of start getting in the habit of providing some explanatory material in advertising rather than just taking it for granted because I think what we're consistently finding is understanding of these terms is patchy. No, I think that's a great point. And actually, I think advertising through repetition would actually build understanding of some of these terms. I think maybe a term that's new to many of us um, and is probably hotly contested in terms of the definition, Jake, would be advertised emissions. Mm -hmm. um, what exactly is advertised emissions? Um, and particularly considering how hard it is to attribute sales to advertising, how on earth can you attribute emissions to advertising? Mm -hmm. Just tell us a little bit about you know, kind of some of the thinking around, around that, that phrase and that concept. Um, I mean, firstly, that's not our study. That's the purpose disruptors and, 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 and the magic numbers. But I do think it's, it's, it's um, important that, you know, we talk a lot in advertising about effectiveness, right? You know, that's, you know, <laughs> the IPA is filled with, with, uh, with, with effectiveness studies. And so we've got to, you know, uh, effectively front up to the fact that the advertising that we do is effective. You know, we, we, we are in the business of selling stuff. Uh, and so the challenge really is, is how do we best measure, um, and, and again, it's the same principle of being precise in our language of, well, what does advertised emissions mean, and where are we now, and how can we drive down the emissions of entire categories? So, for example, in the, you know, we talked a lot about the electric vehicle um, um, uh, section, sector, you know, if everything goes electric in the electric vehicle sector, which is going to, because obviously there's a ban on new uh, um, ICE vehicles in, in 2030 or combustion engine vehicles, you know, what does that drive down the emissions overall of that entire sector? Advertising has a huge role to play in driving down advertised emissions in that particular sector. So I think that, you know, the language that we're using, advertised emissions, climate misinformation, net zero, carbon neutrality, we're all learning them, right? You know, this wasn't, we weren't on stage talking about these things you know, 10 years ago, even five years ago. So yeah. I think you know, we've got to make sure that we're understanding the, this language, relying on experts, you know, like I said about the, um, the work that we're doing out in COP, you know, that's with you know, over 50 climate uh, and misinformation experts that aren't advertisers. You know, the, the letter that I talked about has been endorsed by one of the key architects of the Paris Climate Agreement. So if we're, if we're relying on experts then we can bring this language both into advertising, but also so um, uh, people, citizens, can understand mm. them better too. And advertising has a massive role to play in educating the public about what this actually means. No, and I just, I mean, I think just looking at Slido, you know, uh, I think that people talking about some of the difficulties of how you can be accurate with, glean, you know, with claims on small packaging, 
um, you know, with limited space for complex messages in most media, you know, how can honest brands talk about the good they're doing whilst acknowledging their ongoing impact? You know, that, that is a, I think these are real dilemmas. And the, honestly, there's no glib answer, and we're certainly not going to give you one. I think there's a good question here, or, or point maybe uh, posed as a question, which is, you know, how far should agencies assess the client's sustainability claims are accurate before they create campaigns? Um, you know, I, I think um, that would be a good idea, uh, generally speaking. Um, but it depends on a good, robust working relationship between clients and, and agencies to be able to do that, which I hope in many cases you have. And if you think about, you know, things like Change the Brief, I think that was the whole thought behind Change the Brief, was the ability for agencies in a helpful and constructive way to challenge uh, clients sometimes on what they're trying to put across. Um, and um, I, I think uh, the last point that's been made here about standard definitions for terms like carbon neutral and net zero, you know, um, you know, have have how you know how near are we to having you know kind of standard, whether it's statutory or in practice definitions of these things? I mean, I, from my point, I think we're getting closer. Um, so the the as the CMA, we published advice earlier this year to government suggesting that they implement these definitions in statute. Um, since then, both the um, House of Lords Climate Change, Energy and Climate Change Committee and the UK Climate Change Committee have endorsed our recommendations. The, the research that um, ASA published just a couple of weeks ago showed just how important it was to have those terms. And there are opportunities coming up. There's some legislation in the pipeline to reform um, other aspects of consumer protection and competition law, and I, I think there, there, you know, there are possibly some vehicles coming up where. So we're talking might month, be, months or years. I, I think we're we're probably still talking years because statute is never is never quick. So, so we look to the ASA to help us in the in the interim, really, no with problem. some best practice on the use of these words. Yeah, we'll we'll keep, um, you know, as and when. We're doing lots of active investigations into these issues. We're assessing the, the kind of evidence and the use of qualifications that advertisers are, you know, are applying. So as and when we publish rulings on all of these, we're going to have clearer and clearer precedent, at least, of the ASA's expectations around these claims. And then we'll update all of our guidance accordingly when, when those rulings are published, which is, you know, every single Wednesday there's, there's new rulings yes. being published. So it's... Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Okay. You want last word uh, from one, you, one Jake? Yeah. I, yeah, I think it's really important that, that, that whilst we wait for statutory regulation, because obviously we're still waiting, for example, for the online safety bill, which seems to have cut out things like, you know, uh, harmful but legal speech from that. I think it is absolutely really important to, you know, collaborate across the expertise of the industry, the expertise of civil society groups to really hone down these definitions whilst we wait for statutory, because... As we sort of, as, as is dem demonstrable at COP, we don't have the time to just wait and wait and wait for statutory. Yeah, well said. Uh, really good. So I'd like uh, you to put your hands together uh, for our marvellous panel, Cecilia, Justin, and Jake. And uh, just to say, those resources are available both from the CMA with the six golden rules and also from the ASA. And Justin showed you where that uh, is available. And of course, um, you know, we're seeing uh, from the Conscious Advertising Network and Purpose Disruptors amazingly stimulating, provocative uh, thought, data, and uh, hopefully all of that together will begin your uh, journey to brilliant environmental claims that really put clients who are doing the right thing at the forefront of the consciousness of citizens. Thank you very much.